I'd like to welcome you this morning to the Mount Carmel Church. We're so glad that you're able to um, watch and to listen this morning as we come to our morning worship service. We'll be continuing our uh, series that we've been looking at, Spiritual Warfare. You know, I think all of us realize in our lives that there is a spiritual warfare going on. There is a spiritual battle, that unseen battle that people don't see from the outside, but we deal with daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes minute by minute we deal with these. Because the world is so quick at telling us we need to do it a certain way or do it other ways or, or whatever it may be, and it, we're constantly in that battle. You know, when I think of the word battle, I think of, of two people coming together and battling together, or two armies coming together and battling, and as Christians, we are battling. We are battling the world, we are battling those, uh, those things in our lives that we know, um, that sometimes we just give in to. But today we want to look at this spiritual warfare again, and... Uh, Look at an area that, that I think is important to us today, because I have such a great concern for families today. And uh, we'll be looking at families and looking at the makeup of families over this week and next week, and just uh, looking for what God would have for us. But let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll say our verse of the month today, uh, for the month of October. And uh, the month of October is quickly going by us. And then we'll uh, sing a song, and then we'll uh, be in God's Word. So let's have a word of prayer this morning. But thank you for watching and listening today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the many provisions that you uh, give to us. And Lord, help us during this uh, month and next month as we look at this area of being thankful in our lives, Lord. I pray that we are thankful for each and everything that we have, and that we have a grateful heart. Lord, I pray for those today that are watching and listening, and you know each and every family that is. And Lord, you know their, their circumstances, you know what's going on in their life, you know everything about them, Lord. And as I am very concerned about families today, not only the makeup of families, but just where families are headed, Lord, I pray that as Christians we would be praying for families, we'd be reaching out to families, we'd be praying for our own families, Lord, and continue to ask for continued guidance in our lives. We pray for our service this morning, for open hearts. I pray for open hearts not only online, but in our church building this morning, Lord, as we come together and just rejoice and worship you. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, I pray that our hearts would be open for what you would have for us that we would be prepared to, to look to you for guidance and direction in our lives, no matter what that may look like, and challenge us. But also understand and, and just be rejoicing that we know that you are with us each and every step of the way. We pray for many, Lord, that are having some health issues, whether it be colds or flu or even the COVID, Lord. We pray for them as they recover for that. We pray that we would soon see them again. We know of others that have lost loved ones, Lord. I, I continue to pray for the Martin family. Lord, uh, we've been praying for their son with this tragic football accident that he had and then his mom passing away, Lord. We pray that as Christians we would be lifting their name in prayer and pray not only for the family but this young man that is in a hospital in very serious condition. We thank you for many within our church families, Lord, and we just pray for them. We pray for the different needs that are there and those needs that are with the people that are watching and listening today, that we may just rejoice in all that is said and done and, and through even those tough times in our lives, know that you are with us. But we thank you for this morning. We thank you for our time together, and we just pray for a great morning together today. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said this morning, we're going to be looking and continuing our study of spiritual warfare. In fact, the title of our message this morning is A, a Legacy Left. You know, as we often think uh, of times when we are no longer here, 
What kind of legacy will we leave? Well, we're going to look at that this morning in this passage of Scripture that we see in Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 3 this week and looking at it again next week as we're kind of looking at the family and kind of um, challenging each and every one of us. What does the family look like in our lives through Christ? The first thing we want to do is do our verse of the month, which is found in the book of Psalms. It's a great verse in Psalms 34, 8, which talks about this area of trust in our lives, and I pray that we trust Him. So let's all say this together. Encourage if there's somebody watching with you to, to uh, say this along, and then we're going to sing a song. Encourage them to sing. We're going to sing a song this morning called Blessed Assurance. And Blessed Assurance, we have that assurance that Jesus Christ is with us if we know Him as our personal Savior and has, have accepted Him as our personal Savior. But let's say this together. And uh, then we'll do our song, Blessed Assurance. Psalms 34, verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Psalms 34, 8. I pray as you said that verse today, and first of all that you, you said it along with us, but it's something that you can hide away in your heart. That area of trust, having faith and trust in who He is. Well, this morning we want to sing this great old hymn, Blessed Assurance, and we just pray that you lift up your voice. You know, it tells us in Scripture to give a joyful noise to the Lord. I pray that you do that this morning. Encourage that person sitting beside you to, to give a joyful noise. And you say, but Pastor, I, I don't really, <laughs> I can't sing. God doesn't talk about singing. He talks about a joyful noise. Let's all give a joyful noise to Him this morning. In this great old hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission, perfect delight Visions of rapture now burst on my sight Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His good. And his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long
I pray that you sang along this morning that great old hymn, Blessed Assurance, and how that we can have assurance if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, that He is with us each and every part of our day, each and every step of our day. Well, this morning, as I said, we're continuing our study in this area of spiritual warfare, the unseen battle. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. So if you turn in your Bibles to that passage of Scripture, we're looking at a, a legacy left. You know, what will people see when we are no longer here? What will people see it, that was important that we showed to others? Well, today is a passage of Scripture that we see this whole area of honoring our parents. You know, honoring our parents helps build a legacy for, for future generations. For future generations of Christians and, and, and living it out in our lives. This morning as we start our, our study, I, I thought of a man that bought a donkey from a preacher. The preacher told the man that this donkey had been trained in a very unique way. Because this donkey belonged to a preacher. Well, the only way to make the donkey go was to say, Hallelujah! The only way to make the donkey stop was to say, Amen. Well, the man was pleased with his purchase, and he was pleased with this donkey that he had bought from this pastor. And he immediately got on the animal to try out the, the preacher's instructions. So the guy sitting there, and the donkey said, Hallelujah! He shouted that very loud. And the donkey began to trot. He said, Amen, and, and, and he said it very loud, Amen, and the donkey stopped immediately. Well, the gentleman that bought the donkey thought, this is great. So with a, another hallelujah, he rode off, very proud of his new purchase. Well, as he was trotting along, or as this donkey was taking him along, the man traveled for a long time through the mountains, just kind of seeing how this donkey would react and how this donkey would go, and it, it was going great. But as he headed towards a, a cliff or a drop-off at where he was riding this donkey, he tried to remember the word to make the donkey stop. The man couldn't think of it. He couldn't at all think of it, so he said, Stop! And it, that didn't work, so he said, Halt! The donkey just kept going on. Oh no, oh no, he's, he's thinking, what am I going to do? Bible, church, he, he went to all these religious words. And he said, please stop. Well, the donkey just began to trot even faster. He was getting closer and closer to the edge of the, the cliff, the edge of the trail where he was at. So finally, in desperation, the man said a prayer. Please, dear Lord, please make this donkey stop before I go off the end of this mountain. In Jesus' name, amen. The donkey came to an abrupt stop just one step from the edge of the cliff. Well, the guy, the, the, the owner of the donkey was so happy, he, he just set out and rejoiced, Hallelujah! I guess the moral of the story is that it's not always a good thing to have an obedient donkey, is it? Well, this morning we will be continuing our series, The Spiritual Battle, The Unseen Battle. We'll find that when it comes to our families, obedience is essential. It's an essential element in not only raising our children to become disciples of Jesus, but also in creating a legacy that we can pass on to future generations. You know, I heard a saying this week on the radio that a pastor made. He said this, One generation plants the trees, and another gets the shade. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you're living in the shade that comes from the spiritual trees that were planted by a previous generation. For many of you, there's a rich spiritual heritage that has been passed down to you from generation to generation, maybe by parents, maybe by grandparents, maybe by uncles or, or aunts, or, or maybe just a person in your life that, that you, you were around a lot. And as we'll see this morning, that's an essential part of God's design for the family. 
But I also know that some of you haven't been the beneficiaries of, of parents or relatives that have helped you to grow in your faith. You don't have that rich spiritual heritage that has been passed down through your family from generation to generation. Perhaps you've even, you're even the, the very first follower of Jesus Christ in your family. And if that's the case, then God in His infinite wisdom and grace has provided spiritual parents or people for you that have planted those trees in your life. Now, although the passage we'll look at this morning is on, on the surface a very clear and simple command for children to obey and honor their parents, you know, that command is just part of a larger plan of God to develop followers of Jesus Christ who continue to leave a legacy. Yeah, as we've been studying through the book of Ephesians, we see starting in chapter 4 where Paul begins to give us some very practical instructions about how we are to live our daily lives given what God has done for us and realizing what He has done through His Son on the cross. And then in chapter 5 through the end of this letter is pretty well summarized. Those things are summarized in chapter 5. In fact, verse 18 where Paul commands his readers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 18 of chapter 5. It says in this passage, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, as we see this, this whole area in our lives, and as we look at this, and we look at this unseen battle that's taking place spiritually, you know, it comes down to a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, as we, we looked at it a couple weeks ago at that verse in detail, you know what that verse is talking about, that it's a primarily a matter of being controlled by the Holy Spirit as we are saturated with God's Word. And one of the results of being controlled by the Spirit is that Christ followers submit Submit to one another out of their reverence for Jesus. We see that in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And now Paul is going to apply that same principle of that mutual submission to the relationship between parents and their children. So follow along as I read these first three verses. Last week we looked at that verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God and the importance of submitting to one another and putting others first and being willing to share and to show God's love. And we talked about marriage and how that many people take those verses out of context. And, but it's, it's really not about control. It's about love for one another and submitting for, to one another just as Christ submitted for us and showed his love to us. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. You know, I suppose the, the, greatest, the greatest danger this morning is that a lot of you have just kind of tuned out. Because maybe you're even going to say, well, I'm not going to listen to any more of this passage or listen to any more of this sermon. Because you figure this passage doesn't really apply to you. Since you no longer live in your parents' house or you're not parents or you, you, view that, you don't view this as God's word that, that applies to you today, I want you to realize that I'm convinced that we can all find some principles to apply in our lives from these words of Paul. You know, children, if you're still living under your parents' roof, regardless of whether you're still in, in elementary school, you're in high school, you're graduated, you're in college, or where it is, or maybe you're in the workforce today, then the command to obey and honor your parents apply very directly to you. Parents, if you're a parent, then you have a God-given responsibility to raise your children to be obedient and honoring. Or maybe those here today with elderly parents, the command to honor your parents continues as long as they are on this earth. And even 
after they are gone. For all of us, even if you do not have children, or your parents are no longer alive, there are principles that all of us can apply here in the process of raising spiritual children, which is all of our responsibility in the body of believers. So as we look at this passage this morning, we will be looking at the practical application to our lives, no matter which group or groups we might be part of. In this passage, there are two commands and a promise, and we want to look at the commands this morning. We want to look at each one of them kind of separately. And today we want to look at the commands. Next week we'll look at the, the promise and, and look a little further into what is being said here. But that first command that we see is the word obey. In verse 1, children, obey your parents. You know, the definition of obedience is this, to hear under authority and respond positively to what is being heard. You know, the Greek word that Paul uses here literally means to hear under. So obedience first requires children to listen to what their parents are saying. You know, you can't obey unless you first listen. But listening is only the first step. In order to obey, you must also respond positively to what parents are saying. You have to do what they tell you to do. And the way Paul writes this command, he's making it very clear that this is not just something you occasionally do. It truly needs to be a lifestyle. In other words, obedience to your parents is to be a lifestyle, not just something that you do when you feel like it. Yeah, I don't know how many of you have ever done something or someone has told you to do something and you're obedient to it, but you do it for the wrong reasons. I know growing up there were many times that parents would say, well, you need to do this or I want you to do this, and I would do it, and I would complete what I needed to do, but it was for the wrong reason. Or maybe that obedience in our lives somewhere that we're doing things and, and we're not doing them for the right reason. But it's a lifestyle. And the source of obedience is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because in this verse, it says, Children, obey your parents. What's those next few words? In the Lord. Paul didn't just give instructions to obey. He also makes clear of the source of that obedience. When he writes that children are to obey their parents in the Lord. He is stressing that the kind of obedience that he is writing about here must come from our relationship with Jesus. In thinking about that, I think we would all agree that the family is under attack in our culture today, which has seriously eroded the families in our country. And we all know of families that have been struggling. We all know of families that have been broken apart. We all know of families that are trying to do the very best they can. In my opinion, the decline of the family is spiritual. The only way to address it effectively is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You hear me say it time and time and time again, and I truly believe it. Religion is, or Christianity is not about a religion. It's about a relationship. As we look at this passage, I just want to challenge you. What is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, no wonder Paul writes that wives are to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And that children are to obey in the Lord. You know, God's plan for our family only works when the members of the family have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The idea that obedience is to be in the Lord also provides us with one more important principle that we need to see. The limit of obedience. Don't disobey God. You know, this should be pretty obvious, but the command to obey our parents is not absolute. 
It is also true that this command for children to obey their parents is not limited to children who have Christian parents. Even if your parents are not followers of Jesus, you still have a responsibility to obey them. Except, and I'll use the word except, if they ask you to do something that would be contrary to God's will as what we see in God's word. You know, that principle is clearly illustrated when Peter and the other apostles were commanded by the Jewish leaders not to preach about Jesus. Peter and the other apostles replied in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where it says, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. We also see back in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that went against what was taking place there and went against it because it went against God's word. But this exception should be limited to those issues where God has very clearly revealed His will in the Bible. We also see reasons for obedience. In verse 1 it says, For this is right. So the reason for obedience is, it is right. It is right because that is the way God ordained it to be. The word Paul uses here is the same word where we get our word righteous, which describes the character of God. You know, Paul uses the word here as a transition to the next verse where he's going to, to quote the fifth commandment from the Old Testament as the underlying principle that supports the command for children to obey their parents. You know, children are to obey their parents not because it reduces conflict, not because it makes it easier, not because it is in the best interest of the parents and the children, but they are to do it because it is right in God's eyes. You know, it's really interesting to me that Paul writes that children are to obey because it is right and not some of the other reasons he could have given. He could have given reasons like, well, it's not natural. Because of our old sin nature, it's not right. I mean, it's not natural for us to obey. It's not easy. It's not easy to teach our children to obey, so is it really something we need to do? It may not be convenient. Paul doesn't write any of those things in there. He talks about obedience and the importance of obedience. And why? Why? Because we see, as we see in that passage of Scripture, we see because for this is right. No other reason, no other reason that we should look at other things that we could have excuses for. But it says in this passage, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The second thing I want us to see, or the second command we see in this passage of Scripture, is honor your father and your mother. You know, once again, Paul, Paul's command reinforces the idea that honoring one's parents is to be an ongoing lifestyle. And that's particularly important here because, as we will see, the command to honor our parents doesn't end when we leave their home. You know, the definition of honor is this, to show worth, to show prize, to hold in awe. The word Paul uses here means to place a price on something or someone and, and to prize, to show it as a result of assigning it value. There's a prize to it. There's a worth to it. So in this context, Paul is commanding his readers to assign a high value to their parents. There are two significant aspects to honoring our parents. This certainly goes beyond the idea of just obeying your parents. We see it requires a proper attitude. Do we always have a proper attitude? What does our attitude look like? You know, many of you are probably familiar with the story of the little boy whose mother wanted him to sit down, but he wouldn't sit down. Finally, she took hold of him and sat him down in the chair. He looked up at her with, with defiance in his eyes and said, 
You may make me sit down outside, but I'm still standing up inside. You know, John MacArthur addresses this vital aspect of giving honor to our parents this way. He says, honor is the attitude behind the act. The act is obedience and honor is the attitude. Remember that an act without the proper attitude is hypocrisy. If you do what your parents tell you to do, but you hate it and you're unwilling and nasty about it, then you're a hypocrite. If you do what your parents tell you to do, but you, you're bitter, you're fearful, you're reluctant, you're selfish, that's not the right spirit. God is after the attitude much more than his, he's after the act. Because if the attitude is right, the act will follow. But a right act with a wrong attitude is nothing but hypocrisy. But I want us to see that honor is not just limited to our attitude. It also requires proper behavior. Honoring our parents requires both the proper attitude as well as behavior that demonstrates that we value our parents. And that responsibility clearly doesn't end when we move out of our parents' house or we move away or we grow up. You know, look at how Jesus rebuked many of the religious leaders for falling, for failing to act in a way that honored their parents. Let's look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7, I want to read verses 9 through verse 13. He says this. He said to them, All too well you're, you're reject, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift of God, <clears throat> then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. These religious leaders were taking their resources that should have been devoted to honoring their parents by taking care of their needs and claiming that it was a gift devoted to God instead. And Jesus very clearly condemned that kind of behavior because it failed to honor their parents. Although taking care of the needs of aging parents is certainly one way that we can honor them, we also honor our parents when we live our lives in a manner that is consistent. Consistent with the principles of God that they have helped to develop in our lives. You know, that is a challenge to each and every one of us, isn't it? How are we living our lives and what is our children seeing in us? You know, there is no better way to honor your parents than to live the kind of godly lives that Paul describes that Paul describes in these last three chapters of the book of Ephesians. You know, how important it is for us to think about this passage of Scripture and just these <clears throat> verses that we looked at. Next week we'll continue in our study and continue to look further in. But let me just read these verses to you again. Because <clears throat> as we look at this word obey, we look at this word honor. That's something that all of us should be doing in our lives. Whether we're a parent, whether we're a child, we're, we've all had parents in our lives. And maybe it's that time in our lives or that situation in our lives where we say, my parents weren't godly parents. But you know that you can start that, that legacy in your life and place that legacy and put that legacy and show that legacy to your children by obeying your heavenly Father? Let me just read these verses again. <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Next week we'll look at the remaining part of this passage of Scripture and then look a little bit further in verse 4. Because as we look at this, we're talking about a legacy left. What does that legacy look like in your life? What does that legacy look like in, in the lives of those that have went on before you? What does that legacy look like in your life right now that if God would call you home, what would other people say? Is there obedience and is there honor? Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could spend in your word. We thank you for this morning. Lord, we, we, we just praise you for the beauty that's all around us. The area that we live in, Lord, is just beautiful with color. And dear Lord, we thank you for that, and we see the evidence of you in everything. Lord, help us to obey. Help us to honor. And Lord, we may think that this passage of Scripture is just for children, and it's not for us, but it's for each and every one of us. Because as Christians, as Christians, we serve a Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray as this battle goes on in our lives continually, spiritual battle, that we would be looking to you for guidance and direction in each and every part of our lives, each and every situation in our lives. And that we would show evidence of you to others through our obedience to you and our honor to you and honor to, to those around us. And Lord, if we're a, a child here today, a teenager listening, or maybe a young adult or an adult that still has parents. Are we obeying our parents? Are we honoring them? Lord, help us to do that in a godly way. Help us as parents to show that through our lives to others. We thank and praise you for this time today. We thank you for our time and we thank you for being able to, to put this on Facebook and YouTube for technology. We thank you for those that are able to watch and to listen. And we pray that it's a challenge to each and every one of us, but also if we know the Lord is our Savior, we see, we see you around us in everything, and you are there for us. We pray for parents that may be struggling. We pray for children that may be struggling. Lord, in whatever age of their life they're in, that they would be looking to you for guidance and direction. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching and listening today. And just to, to leave you with a legacy left. What does your legacy look like? Are we doing what we say here in chapter 6? In just these two short verses that we looked at, these commands, obey and honor. Are we obeying and honor? Not only our parents here on this earth, or maybe they've already passed away, are we still honoring them? But are we honoring our Heavenly Father that loves us dearly? I want to thank you for watching and listening today. If you don't have a church that you call home, we would love to have you come and be part of the Mount Carmel Church. If you have any questions about anything you heard or, or about what it means to know the Lord is your Savior, please, please call the church. Our phone number is 814-277-4435. My name is Pastor Brian. I'd love to talk to you. But a legacy left. I pray that you know the Lord is your Savior have that obedience as we read here in honor. Thank you for watching and listening today. 